everyone that we are recording uh, all the sessions. Uh, so we are recording. Um, Uta, you're not in presentation mode anymore. I don't know if you meant to be. Oh, sorry. It just, it just jumped out of presentation mode there. Yeah, that's good. Um, and so uh, for today's talk, um, we've got three presenters and um, I'll start by handing over to Uta Stockman. Over to you, Uta. Thank you, Dana. Thank you. Oh, I can hear myself double. Oh no, now it's better. It's always something with the technology. Okay, um, in, in the next talk, you're going to hear about our research results on advances in the use of biological origin to verify authenticity. And you may ask yourself, why is that important? So as Film explained previously, understanding how products move through the supply chain as shown here, and in particular, being able to verify the geographic origin of foods or be able to identify individuals directly are key requirements for protecting Brand Australia and for a consumer to be confident in the origin of products. One solution that could achieve this is to actually analyze the product itself and to use science to determine the geographic origin of foods combined with enhancing their traceability through the supply chain. So in our research, we explored the tagless verification of provenance and the identification of product through a combination of unique signatures, biogeochemical, isotopic, lipidomic, or genomic, as you can see in this graph here. And you may ask yourself, what is the signature? What are we talking about here? So food products show diversity, for example, in their elemental composition, stemming from the environment they were grown in and production methods. And additionally, food products originating from different geographic regions often also have differences in protein, fat, or carbohydrate content, or other organic compounds. These differences in biogeochemical or isotopic signatures of food products are caused by the local soil or climate patterns. So in our research, we addressed three research questions. Firstly, we looked at which unique biological signatures can be used with confidence to verify biological origin and to determine the geographic origin of food products, enabling their verification to a region. And secondly, how to identify individuals through tagless verification. And then we also looked at how we can share this signature information, preserving the privacy of the data so that specific farm information is not shared in a way to potentially reveal the grower's identity or the local information about the farm soil, water or management practices. So in our research, we looked at two use cases. Firstly, we looked at horticultural products, cherries from the Lepin variety that we sourced from various regions from three states in Australia, as you can see here, from the 2019 and 2020 harvest season. But we also looked at the user case of red meat, which is the purpose of supply chain integrity uh, presentations today as well. Um, and we sourced beef meat from seven beef processing plants from five states across Australia and from various regions within these states, as you can see color coded on this map here. So we also looked at a variety of signatures that we could analyze in our provenance analytics toolbox. So we looked at biochemical signatures that can be related, for example, to the flavors and aromas of a cherry fruit. We also looked at micro and macro element composition of our products, including nutrients and trace elements. We explored also isotopic ratios that can be used as environmental traces um, of the elements of hydrogen, oxygen, and strontium. And we also looked at new technologies to obtain a lipidomic profile 
which basically in simple terms are the building blocks of our cells or tissues that can be related to the freshness of the product, but have also shown differences in relation to origin of product. And finally, we looked at genomic markers, SNPs analysis to identify individuals. And here we not only looked at conventional laboratory methods that involve sample preparations and are cost intensive at times, but we also explored where possible rapid sensing technologies in various parts of the electromagnetic spectrum that are more rapid and cost effective, where we could analyze more data and basically reduce the amount of data that subsequently would need to go to the laboratory for more sophisticated analysis. And here we were also looking at what national data streams in the environmental space are available, such as the Geochemical Atlas of Australia, that we could use to ultimately um, delineate geographic regions where food products were most likely grown in. Here we conducted our research in four steps. In the first instance, of course, we determined our signature. And here you can see the example of determining a rapid biochemical signature and a genomic markers signature. The signature analysis was then followed by a data pretreatment, including transformation, standardization, and normalization of the data, which enabled us to perform multivariate analysis to ultimately verify the provenance of our products. So we conducted our multivariate analysis of the data in three steps. Firstly, we assessed if there are actually any significant differences between the regions where samples were sourced from, followed by a visualization of these differences by producing lower dimensional plots of the data, as you can see here, to assess trends, patterns, or clusters from the underlying variations in the data set. And then this was followed by assessing which components are causing the observed differences. And when we look at the uh, biplots here, um, the regions where our product was sourced from show the same colors, and the regions within the state show different shades of colors. So for Tasmania, green, for Victoria, blue, and for New South Wales, purple to orange. And last but not least, we then looked into methods how we can actually share this data, preserving their privacy, but still being able to know where they came from geographically. So in the next two slides, I would like to show you our examples from our user case, um, the cherries to be particular. And here you can see some results from our biochemical signature. Using our conventional laboratory analysis to analyze uh, the flavor and aroma compounds of our cherry, um, we can see here that these are actually very um, successfully uh, determining the regions. So here we are looking at the point data clouds of similar colors, which separate the regions really well when we look at this graph here. And this works because we actually tested the same variety grown, the Lepin variety, in different states and regions. However, when we compared our 2019 to the 2020 harvest data, we did find that this biochemical signature is influenced strongly by the condition of the cherries at the point of testing. So now I'd like to show you our example from determining a biochemical signature using one of our rapid devices that works in the infrared spectrum of the electromagnetic spectrum. So from the different colored uh, groupings by state and region, we can see that rapid infrared sensing devices have the potential to play a role as a quick first identifier of geographical origin. So for the cherry food, the spectral um, signature that we attained achieved the discrimination by region relatively well. 
Um, however, when we take season and year of harvest into account, we can see that the signature is strongly influenced by season. So if this would not be the case, we would expect the triangles in red and the triangles in blue, as you can see here, to fall within the same data cloud. The red um, cloud uses, uh, refers to the 2019 and the blue to the 2020 data. We found that from our research, um, the isotope signal obtained using conventional laboratory analysis was actually the strongest separator by geographical region based on only three variables, the isotopic ratios of hydrogen, oxygen, and strontium that are actually directly linked to the climate conditions and the parent material of the local orchard soils. And we can see here the 2019 as well as 2020 samples are separated very well by region. They are not influenced by the condition of the cherry fruit, and they are also not influenced by the year of harvest. However, even so, isotope, isotopic signals separate our products the best. They do require specialized sample preparation for lab analysis, and they are not yet a routine testing approach. But in combination of other methods in our provenance toolbox, it's a, it's a strong case to make. And now I would like to hand over to Sonia Dominic that you heard about that you heard from before in our panel session. Uh, Sonia is with CSIRO Agriculture and Food and a group leader of sustainability and welfare. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ulta. Um, so the genomic work that we've been um, doing again goes back to a beef cattle data set. Um, and now that ought to actually demonstrate that region can be identified um, through through biological information. Um, we asked, can we actually zoom into further detail of origin and identify the actual individual that a product has come from? So pre-processing, that is fairly easy with the NLIS, but post-processing, it's, it's pretty challenging. So we wanted to be even more specific about the tools that we might be able to uh, use to do this. Um, and we asked, can we use genomic tools for paddock to plate traceability? Clearly we know that DNA-based approaches work to identify individuals with a high degree of certainty. And it is the only tagless approach that we have. The reason why it's not been widely taken up is that it's currently very expensive. So, um, in addition, it's actually unlikely to be used as a routine tool where um, individuals are tracked with um, genomic information at every point of the supply chain. But it is the only fraud-free approach to validate identity in, in, for example, spot checks, and that can be done at any point in the supply chain. So to start building a value proposition around the use of genomics, my colleague Tanya Roberta and I um, explored the cost effectiveness of panels of genetic markets and associated accuracy to support provenance claims and authenticity, assuming that the number of markets have a relationship with cost. So we investigated two questions. Um, the first one is how many genetic markers, and, and we used SNP markers, um, are required to, to predict genomic breed composition. Um, so we explored a data set uh, that's called the 1000 bull genome data set, which includes tropical composites, crossbreeds, and purebreeds. Um, and after quality control, we had about 2,600 animals and over a million SNPs available to explore. So we determined that with the highest level of cost effectiveness and accuracy, we could determine the breed composition of a DNA sample with only 250 SNP markers. So um, currently in genetic evaluation, the most routinely used um, size SNP chip is 50,000 case. So this was only 250. 
The second question we asked was, what is the minimum of SNP markers required to uniquely identify an animal in a population? Um, we again used the same research data sets and evaluated there was only actually 20 SNPs. So 20 SNPs only to uniquely match an animal in that data set. So it's pretty tiny. So we validated that result as well in an industry data set of 80,000 Angus animals that was kindly supplied to us uh, by Angus Australia. And again, um, the 20 SNPs, um, the, the size of 20 SNPs for a marker panel um, was also validated in that data set. So we acknowledge that at this point in time, um, it's it's a starting point and questions around logistics and data volume, like even with 80,000, this was still a small data set. Um, other questions around the, the data volume need to be answered, but this work has started to unravel questions around the cost effectiveness of tools and there are clear opportunities for genomic tools to become a dimension to support provenance and authenticity claims. And if anyone was in the panel discussion earlier, I sort of made uh, the case how, how that could actually link through existing um, genotyping efforts to build the value proposition around this. So I now hand over to David Smith from Data61, who's been working on the privacy concerns of using biological data. Over to you, David. Thanks, Sonia, and thanks, Uta. So now we've got this, we've collected this information about provenance. How do we use it? So how do we use it by maintaining farmers' data privacy, their confidentiality, mitigating commercial, without mitigating commercial or personal sensitivity? With And so how do we, how do we, how do we get useful information at regional level without revealing private farmers' farmers' um, private identity, local farm information, soil, water, or management practices, and get useful information about provenance. So local, based locally on individuals' data, then aggregated and analysed at scale. So what we have is the first privacy-preserved distributed learning model used for accurate regional primary produce provenance. So we give information at a regional level, but we don't disclose disclose particular information about the that will give away farmers practices or or other aspects of their farm farm use so we we have two use cases so the first use case as Uta was talking to is cherries so in the cherry space, we, we look at volatile organic compounds, which actually give a, a very good indicator of where, of, where, of where cherries were sourced out of five growing regions in, in Orange, Mudgee, Young, London, in Victoria and Tasmania. So according to these, we can actually, we can actually, by finding the maximum correlation between components, we can actually identify well where regions are from and actually, actually publish that information in a perturbed sense without actually mitigating particular local sensitivity in, an, in, in a given farm without giving away that, that information. So yeah, so we are using a thing called mechanical correlational analysis, which is a form of unsupervised learning. And on the left here, we have a, we have a GIS, in, GIS interface that we've developed using CSIRO's Terrier JS platform. So volatile organic compounds, obviously those, those compounds that rat, rat easily evaporate at room temperature, which identify the cherries. So the second use case is beef, which is um, red meat. So, as as Sonia alluded to, there was these we have gen, we have distinct genetic markers and genomics that we captured over twenty five head of cattle, and so we have we have we have we have regional information about the characteristics of that of the of that beef, and then we can actually we can actually associate them to a beef processing plant where we had. Several plants in Queensland um, associated to the cattle, two in New South Wales, one in Victoria, and one in Tasmania. And so the SNP, the the correlation of SNP panels is shown in this in this graph here. And so this is a zoomed out picture showing the areas for the cattle were sourced and in the and to their beef processing plant 
And so in that use case, we actually we, we can preserve privacy at this at this regional level for the beef processing plant. So finally, um, as, as Uta alluded to, lipidomic profiling actually can give a very good indicator of region. So without privacy per perturbation to dis display the display the to publish, we can actually see that these components separate very well in three dimensions in of regions in terms of their abattoir, their beef processing plant for these for this lipidomic lipidomic profile. Uh, lipidomic being those 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 structures, a study of structures that make of make up the basic building blocks of living cells. And so with this very good, very good um, aggregation to particular regions, we can actually then, we can actually publish that data in a, with perturb, perturbing that data to have, to maintain privacy with a, with a given guarantee of privacy, the idea being in the, the perfectly private um, release of data that there's no extra risk of the farmer or, or the proce feed processing lot in in, just in re releasing that data to if the data wasn't released, so with that no extra risk, and we have we have this we, here we report it with respect to processing plants, and we we see that most of the most of the most of the points are clustered in terms of the components of the of the of the cows, which which are with an extended synthetic data set that actually that actually identified two particular regions. So and we just have a amount of privacy guarantee is what this epsilon in, infers. So finally, going back to Uta's original the slide Uta presented previously, we're moving from we've we've moved across the spectrum from signature an analysis to data pretreatment, standardization, normalization, and also looking at genomic genomic markers in that sense, as well as well as biochemical signatures, provenance verification, multivariate analysis, and finally signature sharing. So privacy preserved signature sharing, so we can get useful regional information without without revealing re-identifying farmers or their personal or, or, or commercial sensitivities mit being mitigated. Thank you. Thanks, David and Sonia and Uta. Thank you all three. Um, Sonia, I'm not sure if you can see the chat, but I'll read out the question for those who can't. So there is a question for Sonia around how you think you could extend the value proposition for the use of genomics in provenance and authenticity claims. Paying for a geno genotype for a single application can be expensive, but for multiple applications might be quite feasible. Um, so I'll just before Sonia answers, just ask others to feel free to comment on what you've heard um, in the presentation or ask further questions. Over to you, Sonia. Thank you. Um, yeah, Aaron, so I might, I might describe my ideal world here, um, which is um, a bit of a, a vision of what I think can be achieved. There's hurdles to that, of course. So at the moment, the genotyping efforts are mainly done at the stud level. Um, but when we, we think about uh, the majority of the meat product comes from the, the commercial sector, um, currently there is no genotyping, um, extensive genotyping in the commercial sector, but there is more happening around that where people might use that information for management decisions. Um, so ideally, if every single commercial animal could obtain a genotype, um, that information could be used for management purposes. These animals actually receive, have the phenotype, um, the, the, the actual carcass information, um, which could feed back into the genetic evaluation of the stud sector. So this is my ideal world. <laughs> There's a few a, a few hurdles to that, but certainly that would create a huge amount of value in terms of management, um, fast track genetic improvement of the product and, and productivity. So. Thanks, Sonia. I'll add one more question to that, and that is around the um, use of genomic information and do you still need information, other information sources like the geochemical data in addition to the genomic? I think they, they go together really well. I mean, if you know where, uh, which individual something came from, you still don't know which location it necessarily was. It's a difficulty with animal research, they move around. <laughs> so certainly to, to have the real information around uh, the, the region or the property comes from 
um, the other data sources. But also in terms of the genomics, um, using genomic data, I mean, if you think about how many animals are slaughtered daily, um, it'll be absolutely enormous a database that would be created. So with the combination of geochemical data, you can reduce the search space um, as to where you actually have to then search for, for that individual that you're looking for. So they both uh, go hand in hand. Thanks. Thanks, Sonia. Um, Luta, again, I'm not sure if you can see the questions, the chat. And no, the I no, yeah, you're presenting, that's right. So there's a question here uh, to you, Uta. Very interested in your biz NIR analysis on cherry. Is this based on BRICS, B-R-I-X, sweetness, content combined with colour? Also, if each year was mapped and the cherry harvest year known, would viz NIR be effective as a broad indicator of origin? Um, yeah, so in like the data that we looked at, we didn't have a repository that actually told us what the near infrared or visible um, parts of the electromagnetic spectrum um, actually um, refer to. So we looked at the signal itself um, in, in this analysis, but it, it would actually play a role here. So the biochemical signature that you would uh, obtain with this NIR would, would also um, be affected by, by this uh, attribute. But uh, we didn't look at the quantity or what is actually in there. We only looked at the signals um, of the spectra here. In order to do that, um, you do need a, a strong library of reference um, that links with your infrared spectra data. Thanks, Uta. Um, we've got a question for David too around um, why you need to use synthetic data in the privacy study. Yeah, thanks, thanks, Diana, for passing that on. Um, and so basically, we had we had ground truth data, but to have a rich rich mine of data to actually uh, actually um, publish from, we actually synthesised accurately to that ground truth according to according to mixture modelling across the, across the components of the ground truth data. So to have a more rich source of data, we actually synthesised further data based on the ground truth data. So we had a richer source to do to to um, do privacy preserving transformations to that data and show the effects of show the effects of publishing it. But it's representative of what would be at the farm level with that synthetic data. Great, thank you. Thanks, David. Another question for Sonia, is there a known genotyping price point where we need to work, work towards to make this economically viable? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so I think as part of my presentation, I said um, that so we assume that there's a cost between, uh, a relationship between number of markers and, and the cost of the SNP chip. Currently, that is actually not necessarily the case, but um, assuming, so take, for example, at the moment, um, if you pay $40 for a 50,000 um, SNP chip, um, clearly we want to reduce that cost. But with, with the enormous value, volume that would go through um, with, if, if the majority of commercial animals would be genotyped. Um, you would hope that that brings the price down. Um, but also it depends a bit on what sort of system you're looking at. Like for example, um, if you would apply something like that to Wagyu, um, if you can use, if you can use that that information for for management systems as well, and work out that that you actually um, don't have to feed an animal for two hundred days, uh, not for four hundred days, but for two hundred days, you save an enormous amount of feed costs. So that makes a test very viable very quickly. So the cheaper, the better, of course. Um, Five dollars would be nice. <laughs> but, um, yeah, um, I don't know if we have a representative from one of the genotyping companies online who could make a comment on that. <laughs> well, you, you forced you to a number where you got to five dollars. So I was wondering <laughs> when that number would come. Um, look, I think we're actually right on time now to start the next session. So I just wanted to thank Sonia, Uta and David. Thank you very much for your um, presentation today. Thanks to everyone. <laughs> Five dollars it is, McKeel says. Um, 
<laughs> Thanks to everybody for uh, the chat. Um, and uh, please feel free to contact um, any of the presenters or myself, as I mentioned earlier, if you want uh, any more information.